Folks, the autopsy report has been released uh, describing uh, what killed a 23-year-old Lauren Smith Fields. She is the Bridgeport, Connecticut woman, of course, who was found dead more than a month ago in her apartment. Now, the Connecticut medical examiner says Lauren died from acute intoxication due to the combined effects of fentanyl, uh, promethazine, uh, hydroxine, as well as alcohol, ruling her, de ruling her death in accident. Okay, so it raises the questions. Where did those drugs come from? How did those drugs get into her system? And the man who was with her, did he bring them? What was his involvement? Darnell Crossland is a family attorney. He joins us now from Bridgeport. Darnell, glad to have you back. So, so they lay out the autopsy report. Okay, got it. But more questions than answers. That's exactly the way we are feeling right now, um, Roland. So it's been a roller coaster since yesterday. This family has been calling on a proper investigation from the moment their daughter died, right? We didn't get that. The man that was last with her before she died wasn't questioned. He was just let go. Now, the ME released a report yesterday that says all these foreign substances were in her body when she doesn't use drugs. She's 23 and super healthy. And we're looking now at the ME's report saying, okay, the question isn't what was in her body. How did it get there? That's the question. And when you have fentanyl, for one, and then the other items that were found in her body are commonly associated with date rape drugs, the question still is, if they didn't question this man, if they didn't do any trace evidence from this man's fingers, body, clothes, then we're almost further away from where we should be than we were before she died. And so we're asking this police department to step aside, to allow the team to come in that's gonna do the job. And God is good. We had uh, animal sunshine today because there was an announcement made that this is now shifted into a criminal investigation. But as you said on your show last week, it's one thing to call it a criminal investigation, but it's another thing to be able to prove up the crimes when they've messed up the scene so badly. So the question is, how, do we, how are we successful in this criminal investigation when they botched up the investigation from day one? Okay, so you said some of the drugs found uh, are... are associated with date rate drugs. Explain that. Yeah, so all the experts that I've been speaking to for the last day or so, 24 hours, have made it clear that some of the stuff like promethazine are often found in drugs that people drop in your drink. These are drugs that you see at, at clubs and, and so forth and so on. Uh, so when the scene at the time of her death consists of a condom, with semen in it, a pill that's laying on the kitchen counter, um, lube, and then blood on her, her bed sheets. And they don't look at this man as a person of interest. That gives this man an opportunity to cover his tracks and keep moving. Now, I have to point out this is very important. Um, the uh, medical examiner concluded that this was an accident. And that, to me, in my experience, is another systemic way that black people are disenfranchised and treated differently. And that's why we can't get the results that we want in terms of justice. I've had the same exact case as this some years ago. The doctor involved was a doctor named Dr. Rubin. He's a plastic surgeon out of Greenwich. He's flying in from uh, uh, Nantucket on his private jet. He calls my client, who's a minority, and says, hey, let's party. He has cocaine. My client has heroin. They both party. The, the doctor ends up dying, foaming at the mouth. What happens then here in Connecticut is that they arrest my client and charge him with manslaughter. They also charge him with 21A statute, which is a drug statute. That statute says when you transfer drugs to another person, even if it's not for profit, that's a sale under the law. So they charged my guy, my client, with a 15-year felony for a sale charge because he gave the drugs to Dr. Rubin. And they charged him with manslaughter because he died. In the case with Lawrence Smith Fields, 
if this gentleman brought those drugs to the scene, then that's a transfer and that's a sale. If she died as a result of that, that's manslaughter. But here's the thing. The medical examiner in, in, the, in the case where the white guy dies and is a minority that's with him, they put in the medical examiner's report, death by toxicity, which meant, when I called up there, it meant just the mixing of the two drugs. In Norman's case, instead of putting death by toxicity, they want to give this guy yet another damn way out, and they put death by accident. And I'm totally upset with that, and excuse me if I'm passionate about it, but enough is enough already. These little systemic ways where they treat us differently and they give themselves a pass has to stop. So we're happy that they're now making this a criminal investigation, but there's so much more work to be done. And we have way more questions today than we had yesterday. You made the point about a pill being found on the table and then a used condom with semen in it. Those two items were not, just want to make sure, they were not, they were not found nor were they recovered by the police. That was when the family was allowed into the apartment, correct? That's correct. So that particular yep. peel, have y'all had that peel tested? That's, that's the question that I, I, a conversation I had with the mayor. So the mayor called my cell phone yesterday. He's always had my number. The mayor called my cell phone yesterday. I was in court and I got out of court. Um, I, I, I reviewed a couple of things that were before me in terms of the Emmy's finding. Today, the, the mayor's office uh, and myself, we had a long conversation on the phone. And I told him the police department collected a, a sheet with blood in it. They collected a pill, a condom with semen in it, and a lube. And they collected it two weeks after she died only because we gave it to them. We said, hey, come and take this stuff. So, so, and, so, so, hold, 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 hold. so the police actually did not collect it when they discovered her body. So those items were in that apartment for two weeks. You and the family go into the apartment, y'all collect that, and you then turn that over to the police. What we did, we took pictures of it. We didn't touch anything. We preserved it. We called them in and told them, look, this, look, look what's here. And then they collected it themselves and had the nerves then to say to the family, anything else we should take? And when, when, when that happened, I'm so enraged because they're the professionals. They should have, from the day one, quarantined the area, and they should know what they're looking for. Now that we find out that fentanyl was in her body, um, we know that a couple weeks ago at a white school, some kids died of fentanyl. And when the, when the uh, authorities arrived, they treated the entire school as a hazmat area. They told the teachers, lock in your room and don't come out, even though the fentanyl was in a, some isolated area. The reason why is because fentanyl was so dangerous and it can get in the air. You think the police would have came to Lauren Smith Fields' home when she was reported dead, checked her eyes, her pupils, and try to determine whether, in fact, it was a drug overdose at that point? Typically, the respond responding teams come out with, with um, Narcan because if somebody's overdosing, they can off render assistance. It's important for you to remember this uh, also, Roland. Uh, now that we find out that, that these drugs were involved, highly potent, dangerous drugs, Look at the incident report. This gentleman, Matthew LaFontaine, reports that Lauren looked sick and got sick, but he kept drinking with her. Then he says he lifted her up and carried her to her room. Now, Lauren is not that type that needs to be carried. She doesn't use drugs like that. So whatever went on that night, around 12 o'clock or so, he had to carry her to her room, put her in the bed. And then he claims around 3 o'clock she looked like she was sleeping. And at some point during that time, she started bleeding from her nose. My suspicion is that she was under distress from the time he had to carry her to her room. So in Connecticut, if you cause somebody to be in peril, you have a duty to render assistance. I think that she was dying from the time he carried her in her room. And she started bleeding out. Her, her blood vessels were bursting. This woman exploded. And based on the expert uh, that I've been speaking to for the last two days, they explain how fentanyl causes this explosion inside you. So he probably carried her into that room while she was dying, left her there. And remember when he called the 911, it was 6.30 in the morning. So she probably was in distress from 12 o'clock at night and he's sitting there figuring out what to do while she's dying. Wow. And that's my suspicion. If he's innocent, he's innocent. But that's what we suspect. Darnell Crossland, uh, again, so many more questions than answers. Uh, and again, the problem that we have here, um, because 
y'all discovered it, took pictures, and then they came two weeks later. Literally, if this even went to uh, trial, the defense attorney could claim uh, that anybody could have walked into that apartment uh, in, in that two-week time period, and typically that evidence likely gets dismissed and not allowed into uh, the case. That's ac exactly true. And uh, if your show permits, we found um, uh, a white lady called us up who grew up with the family. She stated today that she felt so bad because she knew that Lauren didn't have a chance because this guy was the one that was with her. She stated that he's very close with the higher ups at the police department. She knows all of them. She knows him and she knows his family. And I mentioned, I said, hey, you know what? You got to go to Roland Martin. And, um, and she said she's open to coming on the show. And so she's a white woman that grew up in that same neighborhood that knows how this whole thing works. And she, she gave us names, rank numbers, serial numbers, and said that they're basically brothers and they grew up together. And so, again, we're going to be asking for a phone dump from Detective Cronin, who was involved at this scene, to see if there was any calls between him and, um, and this gentleman. And also the higher ups, we got their names, too, from this woman. And uh, she's, she's on our witness list uh, as we do our own investigation. But she said she'd be willing to talk to you. And so uh, the, the, this, story, this story is just breaking and is getting more and more and more important that we follow it now than ever. All right, then. Attorney Don Donnell Crossland, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for having me. All right, folks, back to our Roland Martin unfiltered video in just one moment. The video looks phenomenal. See, this is the difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?